Hi doctors, I'm Pearl. In this video, we will be discussing answers to questions in the AMC handbook, in particular those found in the trial examination section. It is best that you buy the actual handbook from the AMC, which you can find in their website. I've posted the link below or you can easily Google it and proceed to this tab, Suggested Reading. First question reads, a 48-year-old woman has had heavy irregular periods every 3 to 4 months for the last 10 years. She had a dilatation and curatage performed in what was hoped to be the premenstrual phase as part of the assessment of this problem. Which one of the following, if found on histological examination of the curettings from this DNC, is most likely to be the cause of her bleeding pattern? A. Normal secretory endometrium. B. Cystic glandular hyperplasia. C. Atypical hyperplasia. D. An endometrial polyp. E. Endometrial carcinoma. In evaluating vaginal bleeding in women, first we look at her age and or her risk factors. According to the RANSCOG guidelines, for Australian women, the average age at menopause is approximately 51 years, with a normal range of 45 to 55 years. In this case, she is premenopausal who has been having irregular menstruation for the past years. A. Normal secretory endometrium is unusual in women who have irregular menstruation. And what we usually see is this, there is normal secretory endometrium with stellate glands with intraluminal secretions, owing to the rise of estrogen levels which support the secretory pattern. Which is contradictory to those with irregular menstruation where there's preponderance of estrogen and usually no progesterone. This actually explains, b, cystic glandular hyperplasia. Atypical hyperplasia and endometrial polyp could result in heavy periods or postmenopausal bleeding. E. Endometrial carcinoma is rarely found premenopausally, but would be more likely in the presence of atypical endometrial hyperplasia. Again, the answer is B. Cystic glandular hyperplasia. Next question A 63 year old man presents with a history of a swelling in front of his left ear, which has been getting larger over the last four months with local discomfort. On examination there is a focal subcutaneous swelling 5 cm diameter in front of the tragus of the left ear as illustrated. The swelling has limited mobility in relation to the adjacent structures. The left angle of the mouth moves less than the right, giving an asymmetric wry mouth when the patient is asked to grin. Eye closure is symmetrical. Which one of the following is the most likely diagnosis? A. Worthen tumor or adenolymphoma. B. Mixed parotid tumor or pleomorphic adenoma of the superficial lobe. C. Adenoid cystic parotid carcinoma. D. Mixed parotid tumor pleomorphic adenoma of the deep lobe. E. Chronic parotitis. Take note that the patient is presenting with symptoms of limited mobility and asymmetry of the face, which is suggestive of an infiltration of the facial nerve that is most usually caused by a malignant tumor. According to Robbins and Cotran Pathologic Basis of Disease, these are the different histologic classifications of benign and malignant salivary glands. Benign tumors are those that end in adenoma, while malignant are those with end in carcinoma. According to incidence, the most common benign salivary tumor is pleomorphic adenoma, followed by Worthen tumor also known as papillary cystadenoma lymphomatosum, then the others follow. For the malignant tumors, the most common ones are mucoepidermoid carcinoma, acinic cell carcinoma and adenoid cystic carcinoma. Among the choices the only malignant tumor that can cause such infiltration of the adjacent structures is letter C, adenoid cystic parotid carcinoma. There are more photos presented in the AMC handbook along with this stem, however as we've said in our review of the AMC images, you should not solely memorize such photos as how it is labeled, since it all depends on how the patient presents in the case. In real practice you really cannot diagnose such parotid tumor by its gross appearance alone. Nonetheless, for the sake of familiarity, you can go through them in our video on AMC images, linked below. Next question. A mother brings her 13-year-old son to the clinic, concerned that he is not developing like his older brothers did, and asks you if he is reaching puberty yet. Which one of the following is the earliest sign of puberty you would expect in assessing whether his puberty has commenced? A. Growth of pubic hair. B. Growth of axillary hair. C. Penile enlargement. D. Testicular and scrotal growth. E. Deepening of the voice. Note that it is asking for the earliest sign of puberty in a teenage boy. In boys, scrotal and testicular growth are the earliest of the signs of puberty listed, followed by the appearance of pubic hair within 6 months, then penile enlargement within 12 to 18 months. Axillary hair does not usually appear until 2 years following scrotal and testicular growth. 
deepening of the voice is subsequent to testicular growth and is associated with enlargement of the larynx. The way I memorize this is that I imagine visually where the numbers are. I draw two number ones on the scrotum area, that's for scrotal growth. Two, somewhere in the pubic area. Three, for penile enlargement. Four, for axillary hair, and five, in the larynx for voice deepening. With this image, I can easily remember that the earliest is letter D, testicular and scrotal growth. The answer is D. Next question, a 15-year-old girl presents with a three-day history of persistent severe vomiting associated with an intercurrent viral infection. She has been complaining of tiredness and lack of energy for the previous three to four months. On examination she has a BP of 80 over 50 mm mercury, pulse 130 per min and has increased pigmentation of her buccal mucosa and nipples. Urinalysis is normal. Her serum sodium is 118 millimoles per liter and her serum chloride is 76 millimoles per liter. Which one of the following is the most likely cause for her presentation? A. Addison disease. B. Salt losing congenital adrenal hyperplasia. C. Chronic fatigue syndrome. D. A chronic reflux nephropathy. E. Hyperthyroid crisis. While Addison disease is uncommon in pediatrics, when seen it is usually in the adolescent age group. This girl has typical features of an Addisonian crisis, with vomiting precipitating circulatory decompensation with hypotension due to her lack of adrenal steroid production under stress. She also has hyponatremia and hypochloremia and, with the hyperpigmentation, these features clinch the diagnosis of Addison disease and indicate she needs urgent resuscitation. A is correct. Salt losing congenital adrenal hyperplasia is usually due to a defect in the enzyme 21 hydroxylase. This predisposes the child to life-threatening salt loss often at an early age due to aldosterone synthesis deficit. Presentation is usually in the immediate neonatal period. Chronic fatigue syndrome, CFS, usually has a prolonged and drawn-out course and investigation and examination are frustratingly usually normal. Chronic reflux nephropathy may be associated with salt loss in the kidney, but the patients are usually normotensive or even hypertensive. A hyperthyroid crisis is unlikely to present in this manner and usually there is associated hypertension and other symptoms like fever, diarrhea, tachycardia, irritability, or anxiety. Next question. A three-year-old girl has frequent episodic asthma and persistent interval symptoms of nocturnal cough and exercise-induced wheezing. Which one of the following delivery methods would be most appropriate to administer fluticasone effectively to this child? A. Nebulizer and pump. B. Breath actuated inhaler, a Q inhaler. C. Metered dose inhaler. D. MDI and spacer device with mask. E. Oral suspension. The method of administration of medications in the management of asthma must be adapted to the age of the child. Children aged 3 years are unable to use a metered dose inhaler alone or a breath-actuated inhaler effectively. Fluticasone is not available in oral solution or suspension. These are the different devices. While fluticasone can be administered either by nebulizer or by MDI with a spacer device, in a 3-year-old child, a mask attached to the spacer is required for maximal administration. If she could not cope with this, using nebules with the nebulizer would then be the next step. Next question. A mother brings in her three-month-old infant daughter, saying she has noted difficulty in applying nappies. Birth was by vaginal delivery of a breech presentation with extended legs. The baby is otherwise well. On examination, you note limited abduction of one hip. Which one of the following additional clinical findings is likely to be most helpful in confirming the diagnosis of developmental dysplasia or congenital dislocation of the hip? A. Asymmetry of groin crease lines. B. Inequality of leg length. C. A clicking hip on extension. D. A jerk while abducting the flexed hip. E. Internal femoral version of the hip. Suggestive early symptoms and signs of congenital dislocation of the hip include diminished abduction and flexion of the affected hip in unilateral cases, asymmetrical skin creases of groin and thigh, apparent inequality of leg length where the affected leg is slightly short and rotated externally, or clicking on hip movement may be noted. To help confirm the diagnosis, Ortolani test can be done. Abduction of the child's flexed hips is performed, where the clinician grasps the upper thighs between thumb in front and fingers behind, while the child's knees are fully flexed and hips flexed to a right angle. Each thigh is steadily abducted posteriorly while the fingers behind apply forward pressure. Positive findings include an audible and palpable jerk or clunk a sudden stop halfway, 
as this observant mother has noted. In comparison to Barlow maneuver, which should actually done first, is done with the affected mobile femur and femoral head telescoped in and out of the acetabular socket by piston-like telescoping movements in the long axis of the thighs. This causes you to hear or palpate a clunk. Ultrasound is done and more useful than X-rays in confirming the diagnosis among infants. The most helpful finding in confirming the diagnosis of developmental dysplasia is actually D. A jerk while abducting the flexed hip. E. Internal femoral version is not a clinical sign in developmental dysplasia of the hip. Next question. A 30-year-old woman delivered spontaneously 20 minutes ago after a 16-hour labor. She was given 10 units of oxytocin, syntocinin, intravenously immediately after the birth and was delivered of her placenta three minutes later. She has since lost 750 milliliters of blood vaginally. After rubbing up the uterine fundus manually, which one of the following is the most appropriate next step in management? A. Inspect the placenta. B. Inspect the vagina and cervix for a laceration. C. Empty the bladder. D. Cross-match blood. E. Give ergometrine intravenously. In this case, we are dealing with postpartum hemorrhage of PPH. According to the guideline in postpartum hemorrhage in New South Wales, PPH is defined as a blood loss of more than 500 milliliters. Severe PPH is more than 1,000 milliliters or any amount that causes hemodynamic compromise or shock. The guidelines presents different risk factors for primary PPH which includes the four TS, particularly, tone, trauma, tissue and thrombin. The most common is uterine factor, but note that most cases of PPH occur in women with no identifiable risk factors. You can review these factors on your free time, you can check the link below. In the management of PPH, you must first respond with basic measures, followed by identifying and treat the cause, then resuscitate, and lastly reassess. Let's go through these algorithm. First, respond with basic measures. This include immediate actions to control the bleeding and prevent deterioration. Most cases of PPH are treated effectively with basic measures. In the first instance for all women when a PPH is detected, Call for assistance. Lie the woman flat. Evaluate uterine tone, expel clots, and perform fundal massage if the placenta has already been delivered. Gain access. Administer appropriate pharmacological treatment. Inspect the lower genital tract for trauma and repair where indicated. Inspect the placenta and membranes for completeness. Empty the woman's bladder. Keep the woman warm. Monitor pulse, blood pressure, respirations, and oxygen saturation every 5 minutes and temperature every 15 minutes and record. Immediate escalation to a medical officer if there's failure in the initial management. Focusing on the pharmacological treatment, here's the table. For immediate management, you must administer oxytocin and or or ergometrine. For early management or when bleeding is not controlled, you can administer tranexamic acid and carboprost. Lastly, for maintenance, you can administer oxytocin or misoprostol. After which, you must identify and treat the cause, as we've mentioned the 4T. The third step is to resuscitate. For circulation, you must do fluid therapy and initial blood volume replacement. Insert two large bore intravenous cannulas and collect blood for urgent pathology for blood work such as full blood count, coagulation screen, group and hold, and the following. For urine output, insert an indwelling catheter and monitor urine output to determine circulating volume adequacy. For fluid therapy, commence rapid infusion of fluids. Blood transfusion should be considered early to restore oxygen carrying capacity, especially when bleeding is rapid or ongoing, and or signs of shock are present. Lastly for resuscitation, to prevent hypothermia, warm all resuscitation fluids, use warming blanket, minimize body exposure and or remove wet linens. Finally is maternal reassessment which include Observation of ongoing blood loss Every 5 minutes assess fundal height and uterine tone and vital signs. Every 15 minutes assess temperature to detect hypothermia and Collect serum blood samples where clinically indicated. Going back to the question, the most appropriate next step after fundal massage is to gain four access and administer appropriate pharmacological treatment, either oxytocin or ergometrine. The answer is E. Give ergometrine followed by B. Inspect the lower genital tract for trauma, then A. Inspect the placenta and membranes for completeness, then C. Empty the woman's bladder which are under-responding with basic measures, followed by D. 
cross-matching which is already under the resuscitation step. Next question. A 52-year-old man presents at the clinic, seeking advice on screening for carcinoma of the large bowel. He has no gastrointestinal symptoms. His younger brother has just developed a colonic cancer at the age of 50. There is no other family history. Which one of the following is the most appropriate advice to give to him about current and future management? A. No screening procedure is required at this time. B. He should undergo FOBT now. C. Colonoscopy should be performed now and, if clear, no further screening is required. D. Colonoscopy should be performed now and at five yearly intervals thereafter. E. Colonoscopy should be performed now and yearly thereafter. In answering questions on colorectal screening, take note of the patient's age and that of his relative who has been diagnosed of colon cancer. He is 52 years old, and his first-degree relative is 50. We have previously discussed this on our video on colorectal screening, link below, where we mentioned that patients may be classified as average, moderate, or high risk. For average risk, the patient must be asymptomatic with no relative or one first- or second-degree relative who's more than 55 years. He must undergo FOBT from 50 to 74, and no colonoscopy is required. For moderate risk, the relative must be less than 55 years, for whom FOBT must be done from 40 to 49, followed by colonoscopy thereafter. And for the rest of the patients fulfilling any of the following criteria, must be referred for genetic screening and bowel cancer specialist. Again, the cutoffs are the following. Average more than 55, moderate less than 55, high less than 50. Screening done specifically FOBT at 50, 40 and 35 and colonoscopy at 50 and 45 respectively. In this case, the patient is asymptomatic whose brother is less than 55, making him moderate risk. Hence, he must undergo colonoscopy every five years. The answer is D. Again, you can watch the video on colorectal cancer surveillance. Next question. A 55-year-old dye factory worker presented with painless hematuria and a computed tomograph with contrast showed a filling defect arising from the renal pelvis suggestive of a urothelial tumor. Which one of the following is the most appropriate treatment? A. Nephrectomy. B. Open fulguration. C. Cytotoxic drugs. D. Nephroeurotorectomy. E. External irradiation therapy. Treatment of these tumors of uroepithelial origin requires removal of as much uroepithelial tissue as possible. In practice, this means nephroeurotorectomy that is the excision of the kidney, ureter, and a cuff of bladder. The answer is D, nephroeurotorectomy. Nephrectomy alone is insufficient as occult distal tumors in the ureter may be missed. Open fulguration or the application of high-frequency electric current is not appropriate for a tumor of the renal pelvis. Urothelial tumors are resistant to external irradiation therapy, making E incorrect. Last question for this video. A 35-year-old business executive, who is otherwise well, presents with a sensation of a lump in the lower pharynx for six months. There are no abnormal findings on examination of neck or pharynx. Which one of the following is the most likely cause of his symptoms? A. Pharyngeal pouch. B. Chronic tonsillitis. C. Psychogenic factors. D. Esophageal hiatus hernia. E. Lingual thyroid. The clinical picture suggests globus pharyngeus syndrome. It is a clinical syndrome associated with a sensation of a lump in the throat in the absence of physical abnormality, and is usually of psychogenic origin. Direct or indirect laryngoscopy, demonstrating normal cords, pharynx and larynx, will facilitate reassurance of the patient. Pharyngeal pouch, a pharyngeal diverticulum associated with dysfunction of the pharyngeal outflow musculature, occurs in much older patients, and is associated with regurgitation of food. Chronic tonsillitis would be an unusual diagnosis in this age group and is usually associated with symptoms like sore throat or bad breath. 
esophageal hiatus hernia is associated with symptoms of reflux rather than the sensation of a lump. Lingual ectopic thyroid tissue would present as a focal swelling of the tongue base or upper pharynx along the course of the thyroglossal tract. That ends this video of this MCQ series. I hope to make more videos on MCQs so please stay tuned for more. Thank you and good luck in your review.